You know, two weeks ago I, I preached a sermon that was titled, Get Ready, He's Coming. Now that sermon told us about Jesus and prophecy. Jesus is coming back someday. We know that. It's an event that we just don't take for granted. We know that Jesus is coming back someday. Today I want to talk to you about why Jesus is coming back and maybe offer some proof that shows how and when he might come. Now, nobody knows the day or the hour, and I don't pretend to know that either. But I found a video that explains in great detail how it's going to happen. This video is called Before the Wrath. There's the picture of the video. It's in our library. And if you would like to see it for yourself, you may check it out. It's a very, very good video. It's not a documentary, although it references many uh, sources, ancient sources. Um, instead, it's a fascinating, forward-looking comparison of the traditional Galilean wedding ceremony with the wedding of the Bride of Christ and the marriage supper of the Lamb. The sermon may sound more like a book report than it does a sermon, but I think you will learn a lot. What we're discussing here is the central purpose of the church at the end times, or the understanding of the rapture and how the church relates to Jesus in eternity. In Ephesians 5, it tells us, for husbands, this means to love your wives just as Christ loved the church. He gave his life for her to make her holy and clean, washed by the cleansing of God's word. He did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle and any other blemish. The church is to be the bride of Christ. The rapture is when he will come for his bride. Now, understanding that, we find in Revelations 19, it said, Let us be glad and rejoice, and let us give honor to him. For the time has come for the wedding feast of the Lamb, and the bride has prepared herself. She's been given the finest of pure white linen to wear. Folks, this is talking about the wedding feast that we will have when we get to heaven. Now, to have a wedding, you have to have a bride and a groom. To have a marriage supper means that the marriage is, uh, is beginning or has begun. Therefore, it's clear from these two passages that the church is to be united together with Christ after the rapture. If you remember, Jesus grew up in the city of Nazareth, which is located in Galilee. There's the map. Can't see very much, but trust me, Galilee's up at the very top and Nazareth is right there. Most of Jesus' teachings were in and around Galilee. Because Jesus was Galilean, he knew their customs and their traditions completely. All 12 disciples were Galileans. They were Galileans from birth as the best of our knowledge, and they lived their whole, town, their whole lives in Galilee before Jesus called them. It's only with the added context of the Galilean culture that we can best understand the meaning of the Lord's Supper, our current time for preparation on earth, the Bride of Christ, the Rapture, and the Marriage Supper of the Lamb. In first century Galilean weddings were one of the most important uh, events that occurred in any town. Now, you got to remember, these towns were small towns. They weren't two million people living in one spot. They were several hundred, maybe a thousand, I don't know. But in biblical times, the lineage and preparation of the, uh, perpetuation of the family were extremely, extremely important. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> your potential opportunities in life and the foundation of your personal history. 
Back to the topic of discussion, which is the betrothal. Today we call that an engagement. In Galilean times, the betrothal, uh, betrothed couple would essentially be married, but their life together had not begun yet. There was no later ceremony or uh, official coming uh, the couple to marriage. The betrothal in process in, in Galilee required the families of both the bride and the groom, groom to meet at the city gates. In biblical times, the city gates were the central location for uh, activities such as announcement. They held court there. Uh, any kind of business, uh, important business, was taken care of there. There were no courthouses. There were no uh, official judges, per se. There was always people milling around at the city gate. As a result, that's where the patrol uh, took place since witnesses were required to establish a covenant. Now, the process included several important steps, but when the father of the groom would read out loud the city gates and in presence of both families, a written proposal for the marriage. Should the father of the bride find the agreement acceptable, he would accept the proposal on behalf of the family. Afterward, the groom's father would give the uh, bride's father dowry. In modern terms, the dowry essentially represents insurance paid by the groom's family to the bride's family. The dowry would be used by the bride's family to pay living expenses for their daughter should the marriage for some reason fail and she returns to live with her parents. However, acceptance of the proposal by the bride's father and the paying of the dowry by the groom's father does not guarantee the patrol will be completed. There's one more key important element before the patrol is completed. The next step requires the groom to pour out a cup of wine and give it to his bride. The groom reverently gives the cup of wine to his bride with both hands and she accepts it the same way. In the patrol, the cup is referred to as the cup of joy for good reason. For the bride, drinking from the cup would likely lead to a life of joy and motherhood. Whereas declining the cup could potentially lead to a life of childlessness, loneliness, and despair. In your life and mine, choosing whether or not to drink from the cup is the single most important choice that we make in our lives. Drinking from the cup brings eternal joy, whereas declining the cup leads to eternal sorrow and damnation. In order for the betrothal to be complete, the bride must drink from the cup. If she drinks from the cup, the patrol will proceed. If she declines, there will be no wedding. No other, me other uh, Middle Eastern cultures, not even the Jewish culture in Jerusalem, gave the bride the absolute final choice to, uh, to accept or reject the covenant. But in Galilee, this was the process. So, assuming that the bride accepted patrol by drinking the wine from the cup, the groom would then drink from the same cup and seal the covenant between them. Now, let's compare that to what Jesus said at the Last Supper. Matthew 26, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and he blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, take this and eat it for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it. And he gave it to them and said, each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. <clears throat> with the covenant sealed, the groom would publicly announce these words to the surrounding witnesses. You are now consecrated to me by the laws of Moses, and I will not drink this cup again until I drink it with you in my father's house. Sound familiar? After the groom says these words, the betrothal is now complete. Both families will drink the wine and break their bread to celebrate. Then both families will go to their respective homes, including the bride and groom. 
<clears throat> the groom will go to his father's house, and the bride will go to her father's home. While they are betrothed with their marriage is, is official, their married life has not yet begun. With the process complete, now the preparation for their wedding feast begins. This could take as long as a year. For the groom, this would entail building a building, a room, onto his father's house, which might meant he might have to build uh, most of the furniture himself, as rooms to go was not open yet in Jerusalem or in Nazareth. Now, let's compare that with what Jesus said in John 14. He said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Also, trust in me. There is more enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm coming, going to prepare a place for you? When I have told you that I'm going to, when I, everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. Just as the Galilean groom went away after the patrol to prepare a place for him and his bride to live, he promised to return and retrieve her when everything was ready. <clears throat> so Jesus went away to prepare a place for his bride, the church, to live, and he promises to come back for his bride. Does that sound like the rapture? The bride, too, was busy trying to design and make the perfect wedding dress. This also could take months to complete. In the Galilean wedding tradition, nobody except the groom's father knew when the wedding feast would occur. The date and hour were unknown to anyone except the father, although there was two known characteristics of the date and the hour. First, the feast would not begin until all of the preparations had been finished and inspected by the groom's father. Second, the feast would begin at some time uh, during the middle of the night. Remember the story of the ten virgins in Matthew 25? It says, Then the kingdom of heaven be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take a long extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out to meet him. And all the bridesmen got up and prepared their lamp. The five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, we don't have enough for, uh, for all of us. Go to a shop and buy yourself some. But while they were gone to buy, the bridegroom came. For those who were ready went in with him, and the door was locked. Finally, when everything was prepared and the day of the wedding feast appeared to draw near, the bride and her bridesmaids would sleep in their wedding dresses every night so they would be prepared to quickly get up and leave when they heard the call for the feast to begin. They did not know the day or hour, but they prepared every day and every night until the appointed time. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 24, however, no one knows the day or hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself, only the Father knows. Guess what? In the Galilean wedding, the father of the groom was the only one who knew when the feast would begin. He would wake the son in the middle of the night and say, go get your bride. The son grabs the shofar or ram's horn and wakes the whole town to let him know he's on his way to get it brown. A shofar sounds like a trumpet. First Thessalonians tells us, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, 
with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. So now everyone is headed to the father of the groom's house for the feast, except that the bride doesn't walk. She's carried in a litter, and they call it flying the bride home. Sounds like 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then together with them, we are still alive and remain on earth. We'll be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Only those in the bride's family, the guests, and others around town who are prepared could join the preparation or the celebration. Those who were not prepared were just left behind. As Jesus warned, he will be coming back as a thief in the night. Matthew 24 says, You must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when least expected. But the amazing similarities between the rapture, the wedding feast, the marriage supper of the Lamb doesn't end there. When the procession returns to the groom's house for the feast, everyone in the procession enters the house, and then the door is closed and locked for seven days. After the door is closed, no one is allowed in. Neither anyone is allowed to leave either. Jesus is very clear in his, in his Matthew 22 parable of the wedding feast that says, though many are called to attend, few will be chosen. So this brings up the question, who can be chosen and how do you become chosen? It does not matter what you've done or not done in your life. The gift of grace is free and it's available to absolutely everyone who accepts it. No one is disqualified from being so long as they accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior and invite him into their heart. The only way Jesus will reject your decision in this life is to reject him. Even if you pre previously rejected him as, or a thousand times, there's still time right now to change your mind. But the window is closing soon. Do not put off your decision until tomorrow because no one is guaranteed that they will have another chance to accept Jesus tomorrow. Finally, one thing is certain. I lost my place. Finally, one thing is certain, the marriage supper of the Lamb will be a party of parties of all times. This is the one party you absolutely do not want to miss, and there's no reason to miss it. If you haven't made the commitment to accept the free offer and drink from the cup of Christ, know that the time is short. Considering the condition of the world right now, it's easy to see the time of preparation is almost over. Make your choice now or be prepared to endure the fast approaching time of tribulation. Will you drink from the cup? Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you that you've given us an opportunity to see into the future, to see what, what um, you have in store for us in the celebration supper. We thank you, Father, for this message today. We pray this in the name of Jesus.